Okay, let's give So basically, um, <clears throat> um, what what was just discussed, right? Um, was um, a, a very generic introduction um, towards the idea of using statistical learning for. Um, for our kind of problems, okay? Um, now, so here is um, again a picture I shows, showed last week, which um, summarizes a little bit the workflow and that is, of course, to be um, uh, compared to uh, what you would do with quantum mechanics. So suppose you want to um, predict um, the quantum properties of a compound, right? To make certain choices in terms of basis functions, in terms of how you approximate Schrodinger's equation, um, securing the CPU time, all these things you have to do. Um, and then you can solve it with this one input compound and you get the, the the numerical solution of this differential equation now the statistical approach is fundamentally different as you can see here um, you don't um, care about the details a priori of um, how shooting equation was approximated you don't care about basis sets. Um, you you don't care about all of that. Um, you all you need is a training data set. Right? Um, so basically, the upfront work, in some sense, is shifted from finding good approximations, from finding good basis sets that work for your properties, converging those, all these things. Um, is replaced by um, the, 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 the task that can be trivially formulated as getting more data. Now, getting more data is not a trivial thing. Um, uh, in particular, as you can imagine, um, from the garbage in, garbage out model, um, so the, the um, curation and the specific acquisition of your data um, can affect your model's performance tremendously. But um, the same holds for basis sets and approximations, right? You can uh, come up with silly approximations to Schrodinger's equation um, that are easy to do, right? And then, but then you shouldn't expect a good performance, right? So. Um, this, this uh, garbage in, garbage out uh, always applies, uh, no matter what you do. And um, in this case of supervised learning, um, the standard procedure, the standard workflow is that you've shifted the work um, upfront, right? You do not solve anymore on the fly for every molecule, um, the, the um, variation of principle. Um, you do instead collect that data and train a model on that data. Right? Now, as Simon just mentioned, that training um, can be costly. It could imply that you have to invert a big matrix or it could imply uh, uh, substantial high dimensional optimization in all your regression parameters. If, if you don't have a kernel method, but some other regressor like a neural net or some random forest or whatnot, so this is not a free thing, right? The training box in, in, on the slide here is not um, for free. Um, and uh, the acquisition of the data is also not mentioned, right? Uh, how expensive was this to get the data, right? That's also, um, yeah, can be arbitrarily expensive, of course. Um, so the example of uh, the weather, um, was one, um, in fact, Krieging, which is um, 
um, an engineering approach by uh, a Dutch engineer called Krieging uh, towards something which looks like a Kernan method. Um, he wanted to predict uh, the location of the next best gold mine. Okay, so every data point was a gold mine. Uh, now, how imagine how expensive it is to get that data point. <laughs> you you have to dig and make a gold mine, right? So that's truly expensive data. Then. So um, these are um, things, of course, you you have to be aware of, right? Data is not for free. And many of the machine learning models that have successfully been applied already, they actually work on abundant and cheap data, right? Um, and so it's not necessarily a good idea to then blindly reapply these approaches to cases where data is scarce and expensive. So um, one, one has to, to be aware of this, right? Um, now, <clears throat> Once you have trained, right, the next step is your prediction. Right? Um, and then this prediction is, uh, in comparison to quantum calculations, uh, usually uh, many orders of magnitudes more efficient um, because you do not have to uh, do this iterative self consistency loop, uh, or you do not have to solve for all the coefficients in your quantum wave function. Right, um, you don't do this on the fly anymore. Rather, you just interpolate. You infer the solution. You do not solve it. Okay, so this is um, a fundamental difference. Right, and, and so um, in this sense, um, uh, of course, we you you can always play devil's advocate and um, uh, be biased and preferring one over the other. The way I like to see it is that these are meant to be complementary. Right? This is not meant, one is not meant to, to displace the other or to fully replace it. But um, I, I believe uh, you will get the most out of it if you can combine these uh, two approaches in, in good ways. So that's um, then how um, for today's lecture, which unfortunately is the, the last in the semester, and um, that's basically what I want to convey. Um, I, I will tell you about examples where, in my opinion, um, this kind of fruitful complementarity um, has been shown already, right? Now, um, this is still uh, very young. You, you see here this uh, PIL um, where we demonstrated for the first time that you can infer QM solutions for compound space um, in a systematic fashion, that means with a decaying uh, learning curve like this. Um, this um, is just 10 years ago, okay? Um, and um, of course, at the time, as you might know from your, your uh, uh, from general knowledge, at the time when you do something for the first time, uh, by definition, there's not a big community doing it. So um, there were very few people and uh, this community has grown tremendously by now. But in the beginning, uh, the, the, uh, the frequency of contributions in the field was very small, right? So, so it's been taking off uh, nicely. So um, I think by now, um, everything I'll be telling you about it will no longer be considered controversial. But mind you, just 10 years ago, this would have been crazy. Not much of it right now. All right, um, again, as, as Simon also mentioned, right, um, cross-fold, um, K-fold cross-validation is really the protocol to uh, protect us from um, overfitting and uh, uh, allow us to optimize hyperparameters, even if we have um, more parameters than training data. Um, and then uh, Simon also nicely described the overfitting and underfitting regime. Right, and I think again, just to recap, um, to view your models rather as something that should go, something like an interpolator, right? That should go exactly through those points, um, your training data points, right? Rather than um, having something that compromises between your training data point as it would have been done in traditional fitting, um, which um, is more similar to what we have in experiments, right? 
um, uh, where you assume that there's some uncertainty on your training data, right? Um, and you, so you, you want that curve that um, uh, is permissible also within that uncertainty, the experimental uncertainty window. When we um, solve uh, the quantum chemical approximations, um, and if you've done everything right, um, your signal should be orders of magnitude larger than your numerical noise, okay? So for all intents and purposes of fitting and statistics, you are dealing with noise-free data, okay? And so um, this means basically that your model should go through your data. Right? Um, there's no reason. The perfect model, the truth goes through your data, right? your, your reference truth, not, not the absolute truth. But your reference truth uh, goes through that data, and so a good statistical model should also go through the data. Um, now, interestingly enough, we know also from traditional numerics, um, we have interpolation schemes such as splines. Um, to the best of my knowledge, no uh, rigorous comparison has been yet made uh, to uh, compare splines with um, the performance of um, uh, machine learning models in, in higher dimensional spaces, such as um, uh, chemical compound spaces. Right? Um, it will be quite interesting to see learning curves for, for splines methods as well. Um, and uh, that could possibly also indicate that um, the formal scaling for kernel methods where you um, uh, grow cubically with number of training sets uh, for inverting matrices, which you can do in smarter ways iteratively, and then you, you can break down the scaling. But um, you might um, escape a lot of the scaling by, by at some point dialing in a, a splines approach. Or, um, but this hasn't been explored yet. So, so such hybrid models, right, um, uh, still are very much in the beginning, I believe. Now, um, <clears throat> we ended uh, last week uh, with this figure here. So um, in comparison to traditional fitting shown here in red, what you should um, uh, find for your errors is that um, as a function of training set size, um, they, um, uh, you can distinguish between the test and the train error. And so in the traditional fitting picture, you have very um, low training errors only in the beginning when your rigid model is still flexible enough to fit um, every training point. But then as you add more, it's, it's no longer, it's too rigid and um, it doesn't reflect properly the, the, uh, uh, the target functions, uh, true dimensionality and true uh, uh, variations. Um, the, um, a, a proper machine learning model should um, then by contrast, uh, give you the blue curve, right? And now um, I cannot stress this enough, but um, you, you should remember that uh, in the quantum chapter, we talked about um, the hierarchies of method. We talked about DFT, for instance, being a particular sweet spot. Right? Now, um, how did DFT manage to uh, make a jump on this Pareto front of cost versus accuracy? Right. Um, so this was a major um, breakthrough, a scientific breakthrough by, um, if you wish, uh, genius humans who, who came up with this, right? Um, and what's appealing here and at the same fright time frightening is that these curves would suggest that you can replace that human genius by simply adding more data. Right? So then you, you can uh, make your model arbitrarily more accurate um, and uh, you don't need um, that human innovation. Right? So I think this is a message which um, raises concerns uh, in conscious or unconscious ways among many scientists, right? And um, so you have to be aware of um, that promise and um, its potential. Um, uh, implications. Um, all right, so um, this slide here is now um, a little bit more about these learning curves. Um, uh, 
You can view them as a Pareto front, right? The, the training uh, set size versus uh, the accuracy, right? So ideally you would like to be down here in the corner. Um, and obviously um, the, the closer your learning curves to that corner, the better your model, all right? Now in practice, it could be that you have some budget um, which defines how big your training set can be. Um, and you might have um, from the problem you're considering, you might have some accuracy threshold which you'd like to reach, right? Where you say only once my model is um, sufficiently accurate to pass this uh, threshold, only then it's gonna be useful to solve my, my scientific problem. So um, then a, a working machine learning model might look like this dotted line, but of course you, um, within your budget, you do not reach that accuracy. But beware of a model, um, something like this traditional fitting model, right? It could like, look like this. So in the beginning, your functional form might be physics inspired, right? And, and so it might give you rather low errors, and then, however, you, you hit that limit, what it can do in terms of functional flexibility. So it levels off. It's not a true machine learning model. And while in the beginning, you might be thinking, okay, this test error is much better. In the long run, it will, it will, not con it will never convert. So um, you, you, this um, tells you why a single error um, reported for a single training set size is usually um, not sufficient to draw uh, general conclusions about your model. Right? You, you need to test the, uh, the linear decay at least on this log-log um, plot. Uh, so to test if this is a linear line, you, you should have at least uh, three different training set signs. Right? Um, <clears throat> But um, uh, ideally, of course, you, you should have uh, many more training set sizes. Now, um, as I mentioned before, there's proof that this prediction error must decay, the leading error term must decay um, inversely with training set size and this B exponent. So there's some statistical argument that, that this should be um, uh, really a, a square root here. So uh, one half. Right. Um, but um, so in practice, um, it, it can change. Um, but um, we know something like this must also hold for neural nets that are sufficiently large, um, uh, as shown in this uh, neural computation contribution by Klaus Robert Müller and others in, in 96. Again, um, these numbers might be before you were born. But still, um, so in 96, I did my high school diploma. And, uh, so th this is not, um, uh, this is still quite recent, right? If, if you um, become aware of uh, the time scale in which industries change, for instance, um, uh, you, you can um, see, uh, let's say somebody extremely aggressive like Elon Musk, how long did it take from the first Tesla car on the street, which were these little racing cars, to what you have now, right? Despite all his aggressiveness and momentum, it took multiple years, right? So um, you can see from this that this is still a, a very recent uh, development there. And um, in the curriculum of, of most um, uh, MINT um, uh, topics, um, I do not think that uh, this is, um, so unless you're, you're talking math, um, that this is typically included, right? Uh, and no textbooks yet in the various uh, fields and so on that, that bring this up. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the, uh, I would like to tell you now in this lecture about examples where, where this was uh, put to use and uh, where you can get some feeling um, from uh, uh, the performance and, and what one can do with this, okay? Um, so, um, as we said, we need data to, to um, do anything numerical. And so, uh, 
in uh, 2014, um, my group published a, a set of quantum um, chemical results for over 130,000 molecules. And this was funny. Um, the idea for this came up uh, during a coffee break. And Raghu Ramakrishnan was a postdoc in my group. And uh, um, basically, we propose, he proposed this. And uh, I first thought this was a silly idea to uh, run uh, in, in some um, yeah, brainless way uh, QM calculations for over 100,000 molecules. But um, it was, um, in hindsight, it was really very timely and excellent. And um, so one of the conclusions from this is that, um, and, and that might seem obvious, but uh, still uh, many people fail to actually then implement something. One of the conclusions is of course, that every data point is worth something, especially when it's a QM data point. And so whenever you find an idle CPU somewhere, you should be very concerned in your own self-interest to make this uh, CPU uh, be busy and crunch out reference data for you. Um, particular in light of the vastness and, and scale of chemical compound space, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, coming to this uh, set again, so we pick from the GDB data set, which is the string of, of organic molecules, um, there's, uh, it goes up to uh, 17, well, depending on the GDP generation, but uh, the latest, I think, goes up to 17 heavy atoms, not counting hydrogens. And so um, uh, from these uh, strings, we selected um, all the smallest molecules with up to nine heavy atoms, right? Um, so there's roughly 134,000 molecules in this. Um, and this is what we dubbed the QM9. Uh, we did, um, you can see this in, the, in this uh, flow chart. We did um, QM calculation. So we took the, the strings and Corina is a code that uh, generates uh, coordinates then from that. And we did a semi-empirical calculation. And from that, we, we did a DFT calculation to get DFT coordinates and structures. And then we did some consistency checks to regenerate uh, the smile strings uh, at each state, stage and to compare if, if this uh, molecule was still um, alive in the sense of, of the smile strings or if it had changed in character, meaning that it had reshuffled its, its bonds. Um, so there's a distribution, a simply frequency distribution as a function of size. And this is number of electron pairs, right? So um, for a given number of electrons, um, you have an isoelectronic. There's a set of isoelectronic molecules and each block here corresponds to one stoichiometry. Right? For each stoichiometry then, you um, can have many different constitutional isomers. There are no conformational isomers in this data set, right? So for every um, uh, molecular graph, there's only one molecule. So that's, um, that corresponds uh, to how most organic chemists uh, think about compound space, right? They tend to um, at first um, neglect uh, conformers and only later on uh, conformers might, might play a role as well as stereoisomers and so on. So, in some sense, there's still a coarse um, representation of, of chemical space, right? Now let's pick out um, the stoichiometry that's the most frequent, that's the C702H10 stoichiometry. Um, it has uh, something like 6,000 uh, molecules and they are ranked here by the, um, by the energy of uh, the enthalpy of atomization. Calculated with P3 lit. Um, and you see here um, a very interesting, a very linear um, increase, right? So, very homogeneous um, distribution, actually. Um, and um, in, in this region from of 50 kK per mole, right? Roughly speaking, you have something like 100 molecules in 1 kK per mole. So that's sort of the, 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 um, the energy density 
if you wish, and can make a compound space for just for this subset in, in a region, in an energy region um, where, where this stoichiometry is, um, is well represented, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, you could ask if, is this complete, right? Is this the limit? Um, we think there, there are more molecules. Uh, you could realize um, there have been certain design rules applied to GDB-17 that uh, have excluded more compounds. So in some sense, this is, um, uh, you, you should expect at least 100 molecules uh, per kcal per mole and, and some organic molecule like this in, in the regime where, where they are um, frequent, right? Now you see also, of course, um, that there's a global minimum. And so by its very definition, there are not many neighbors, okay? Um, and same up here, right? Um, uh, they're, they're, at some point, uh, your, your, the number of bonds you can form is exhausted and, and then you will have very unstable or, or uh, you will have less bonds and, and then uh, you, you will go up. But there are um, many, much fewer uh, possibilities to have few bonds um, than there are uh, possibilities to have many bonds. Right. So also here, your, your scars. Right. Um, so this is um, chemical compound space. It's, it's not this infinite set, right? You, you have uh, regions where, where in, like a hypersphere, where, where you have a high density. And then uh, outside that region, it's, it's very scarce, right? Life is scarce. And again, we talked about that, right? The, the, the finiteness, there's just one diatomic with the uh, strongest bond, and um, in this universe, you will not find any other diatomic. So similarly here, there's one global minimum, right? And then you, this universe using this stoichiometry, um, you will not find anything below that. There's a distribution of quantum properties in, um, in QM9. These are the energies, so this is normalized so that uh, you can compare the units. Um, this is, these are the energies, there's the HOMO, the LUMO distribution. You see the LUMO is, is, um, has multiple uh, peaks. Um, the dipole moment is, is a norm, right? It's a norm vector, so um, it has to be positive and uh, get skewed like this uh, because we, we normed it. Um, and then the, the polarizability is this blue uh, peak. We have heat capacities related to entropy, right, in, in green. And you have the, um, the vibrational frequency of the uh, highest, the highest vibrational frequency in the molecule, which is omega-1. Um, also, other vibrational frequencies are included in the data set, but they are not in this figure either, right? And you also have the zero point vibrational energy and uh, here the delta, the band gap. So that's uh, HOMO minus LUMO. And so it inherits the multiple peaks from, from the LUMO when you subtract something like a, a single peak uh, distribution here, right? So coming back again um, to our learning curves, right? Um, we can now uh, make such figures on such properties, okay? So we have the coordinates, we can make the representation, we have the labels and the features. And we can now test this, right? Is our model a bad model, so a, a more traditional fit, or is it a good machine learning model where, where our, um, uh, our learning curve is supposed to come down systematically as we know it should? particular for something like a kernel rich regression model, right? Um, <clears throat> so the question is what affects these um, learning curves, right? And something um, which becomes immediately clear is that uh, certain symmetries have a very strong effect on your, on your learning curve. So if you manage to exploit this symmetry, your learning curve, your data needs are much smaller. Right? And if you fail to exploit that symmetry, that means that your data has 
to cover all the sim symmetry operations, right, in order for the machine to, to properly reflect um, uh, what's happening to your target function upon such symmetry operations. So um, trivially, suppose you, you have to, um, you don't know about translational invariance in your XYZ coordinates of your molecule. So suppose you put in XYZ coordinates as a representation. Um, and uh, so a naive model would of course assume as you translate you, that entire vector of coordinates, um, your input changes, right? Um, now what happens to your function, right? Um, so if, if you want to do this, you, you would have a, to represent, to inflate your training set by those translated coordinates and you just copy your label, right? Um, for, for those translated guys. And so that's how you encode that symmetry, right? That's, that's the, the easiest way to encode that symmetry, right? You, you simply inflate your training set. But what does this mean for your, for your model, right? So um, suppose your, your training set N is now, uh, let's say three times um, uh, larger than, than the uh, than a rep, a training set you would need if you could account properly for symmetry, right? Then this means basically, if you um, substitute this in this formula, it means that your, your offset of your learning curve is shifted upward by B times log three. Right? So that's what it means. Right. So your, your, the offset of your training curve is directly affected by your capability to encode, to include that symmetry in the representation. There's another thing um, we should notice, um, or we, we can't help but notice, um, that um, if you look in particular at this kernel model, right, um, you, you, you have this weighted sum over training instances, right? Measuring some distance here. But um, if you invert this kernel, right? This contains your, your input, right? Like, like your coordinates or your Coulomb matrix or whatever. But so this kernel inversion is ignorant of your property, a priori, right? Um, the property comes in by multiplying in the, the label vector here, right? So in some sense, the most expensive part of the training is um, independent of your property. Right? And so this, is, this bears some similarity to um, your wave function. Your wave function, as it comes out from the variational principle on, on your expectation value of your Hamiltonian, right? this wave function does not depend on your property on the property you're interested in. You will get that property by using that wave function um, to evaluate the expectation value, right? And um, so similarly here, our kernel takes sort of the role of this wave function, right? And then the alpha coefficients, which, which you get by training, they will take care of, of your observed. right? If, if you go from, let's say, homo eigenvalues to lumo eigenvalues, it's the alphas that change, not your kernel. Um, <clears throat> so the, the formal, a more formal link between these two, right? If the similarity can be connected more formally, um, this is still something um, which, which I, I believe it, it hasn't been done. It um, is closely related, right? To, to having a wave function that, um, works across chemical compound space. So an extended wave function that includes composition, just like the kernel does, might be able to deliver something like that. Um, now, um, we uh, wanted to test this uh, similarity and demonstrate this um, at least numerically. And that's something we did in, in 2015, uh, also with Raghu. Um, and what we basically, we, we reformulated a little bit uh, things with a different um, um, nomenclature here, um, but um, it's the same as a kernel model. So what we have is some property of a query compound Q, 
and your sum over training instances t and the coefficients so these used to be these alphas they are property dependent right but your kernel depends only on q on q and t right and so you get your coefficient vector by inverting your kernel matrix with, with some regularizer now, and so you solve um, this this Lagrangian as a regression problem, right? And when you solve this, you can then see for different properties p, right? So you can have p one, p two, p n, right? So for n properties, you basically have this matrix of property coefficient. So number of training instances is is the length, and the height, and then the width is the number of properties you're considering right? and you get that by multiplying your inverted kernel with the matrix of the reference property right so in other words for many properties you can formulate um, your uh, training uh, in, in this uh, one equation here in the matrix uh, the formalism so um, what we did was to say, well, let's take a kernel um, function, which is this, um, this kind of Slater shape, right? So, so just exponential decay. In, um, in many machine learning papers, this is also called a Laplacian kernel. And um, we didn't want to do a hyperparameter optimization of the width. Instead, we took a heuristic approach where we say, Whatever your training instances, this Kij should always be, be between one half and one. Right? So it's one if you're sitting on the same molecule, but the molecule the further, furthest away um, from any other training molecules should um, result in a kernel that is equal to one half. And so this means for the maximal distance, you can then solve for the sigma. And the sigma optimal turns out to be the maximum distance over log two. And so that's a simple heuristic. Of course, you could also put some other number here, or instead of the d max, you could say the average max shouldn't be, uh, what, the average distance shouldn't be uh, whatever your threshold. So you can play with this, but this is sort of a choice we, we made here. So um, with this choice, again, this is independent of your properties, right? So you have a property independent kernel and um, this means you can make learning curves now for all the different properties we had so these are more the extensive and these are more the intensive properties and at every training set size we have used now the exact same kernel for all properties okay and you see that uh, we recover the learning curves um, and per linear shape on this log log scale just as you would uh, hope hope to, to recover right so um we we were um uh, glad to see this right so that this kind of reasoning uh, seems to work and if you use a different representation here we use this back of bonds representation i think we come to that later and um, uh, your learning curves can also be uh, slightly better if you wish um, there is um, also this question of um, correlations, right? We, we um, discussed this last week for the homo eigenvalue versus the atomization energy. It, seemingly, there is no correlation. And um, so we were wondering, um, as in that example, the neural network coefficients um, actually did carry some implicit correlation. We were wondering if and the kernel um, coefficients do carry some correlation too. And what you see for two properties, the electron spread versus the enthalpy, when you plot their coefficients, you see a sort of anti-correlation, right? So, so coefficients that um, affect strongly your R2, right? They, are, um, uh, they do not uh, have a big role in your enthalpy and vice versa. Um, so, so that is interesting um, for um, a relationship where the properties do seem to carry some correlation, right? Um, so, the polarizabilities and the enthalpy, um, there seems to be less correlation than among the coefficients. 
So it could be that there's this, um, so either you have correlation in a property, then the coefficients are, are less related and vice versa. Um, but these are things um, that uh, still uh, would have to be um, analyzed in, in more detail in the future. Is it, maybe I have a question on this one. Um, yeah. So the coefficients like directly correspond to data samples, right? Because you kind of use sum over your data samples and each coefficient is kind of the weight of one data sample. Absolutely. So like the national question is if you see these kind of lines of having high or low importance, did you look what kind of molecules kind of drive this high or low importance? You would expect if you kind of look at now all the kind of coefficients yep. that line up vertically. Um, That's look a at good it. example, a good question, right? Um, we, we did not look at that. Okay. But, but it's a very good point, right? Um, yeah, you you would so um, it's the the one one is very tempted to assume that if your coefficient is large, that training instance bears um, um, a disproportionate importance for the accuracy of your model. Um, that is typically um, not true in general, right? You can easily test this by taking that one out and see if your model gets much worse. Um, but this is typically, you don't see this. And the reason is that through the inversion of your, when, when you invert your kernel without that one example, right? Basically the weights get reshuffled on all the other uh, remaining training instances. And this is ex this is fully non-local, right? So um, you you don't it's it's not um, usually it's it's not legitimate to uh, jump to such conclusions. Right? But I agree that further analysis here on uh, specific molecules would have been very instructive and interesting. Um, again, so. The field is so new also that I haven't seen much analysis in this direction going on yet. So to truly connect right, the, the statistical outcome right, to the underlying um, trends in chemical space. It's still our, our real understanding of what happens here is uh, still sort of limited. Now, um, let me come uh, back to this uh, question of the Coulomb matrix. Um, so um, as you remember, the, it's, it's this, um, this atom by atom matrix, um, and it meets it meets uh, a couple of uh, conditions um, which are or, or, uh, characteristics which seem uh, to be desirable. So for one, it should be unique, right? and and I come to that uniqueness. Uh, point later it should it would be good if it encoded already the the underlying symmetries uh, such as translation or rotation and invariant also that um, uh, parts of your molecule that are symmetrical to each other they should be somehow represented in the same way right there shouldn't be uh, some some bias uh, uh, so symmetry or molecular symmetry should somehow be uh, encoded and um, it would be great if it was of constant length in the sense that um, if you have more atoms, your, your, your representation shouldn't change. Um, and also that the way how you index your atoms is of course um, irrelevant for your, your QM expectation values, right? So in the Hamiltonian, we sum over all atoms before it's applied to the wave function. So your wave function doesn't know about your atom indexes. And so um, if your representation is index invari uh, variant, index dependent, just like any matrix would be, um, then you, you, have, uh, you might have a, a problem. Right? Um, now, um, we, we look, when, when developing the Coulomb matrix, we looked at um, uh, various ways to represent it. One way was to use its eigenvalues, so this sort of depicted here. Another one would be to sort it by some norm, right? So sort indices by norm, right? Like, like this here, it would effectively become index invariant or, or at least consistent. Or you can also use um, an ensemble of randomly permutated Coulomb matrices. So 
to take care of the indexing. Now the eigenvalues are index invariant, and and so this was actually in the first learning curves I showed here um, in, in the PRL. Um, these were um, obtained with the eigenvalues. Okay. But already then we, we discussed that you can um, also have sorted Coulomb matrices or, or these permutations. For the neural network um, study I, I mentioned earlier, where um, we had this correlation between the coefficients, uh, actually we used a, a set of permutated matrices. Now, let me um, go a little bit more into detail. Why is it that we really um, require uniqueness? Um, so in this paper, um, we gave a, a sort of proof which follows the reductio ad absurdum. It's given in, in writing, but uh, let me read it through you. So suppose D is a descriptor that is not unique, right? So that's the ad absurdum, right? We, we assume the opposite, right? Then um, there would be two systems, two different systems, uh, with the Hamiltonians one and two not being equal, right? Um, that differ, um, these systems differ, but they map to the same descriptor. Right? So H1 would be D and H2 would also be D. Right? Now in general, H1 and H2 differ by more than their properties and variances, um, meaning they have, um, different wave functions. And um, for, so here we also, um, we, for the time being, we ignore the, the degenerate uh, situation. But so this means um, that the two different wave functions will give you two different um, observables. Now, now a trained statistical model um, must predict any observable O only because of the descriptor input P which means that the model will give you the same observables for the two different systems, right? And so in the limit of infinite training data, we know that the predictions must be exact. Right? So this means the infinitely trained model um, will predict O1 to be O2, which is in conflict with, um, with this notion that uh, they must be different because they have different wave functions. So um, the, the lack of uniqueness therefore constitutes a severe problem. It means that you can get absurd results in the sense that um, the same observers are predicted for uh, different systems. Um, so in some sense, um, uh, what you have then is if, if these compounds live in compound space, right, and mapping them onto a descriptor manifold, if you're not careful, can lead to loss of uniqueness, and then you have a conflict, right? And it actually turns out for the eigenvalues of the Coulomb matrix, you can construct such cases. So you can construct different molecules with different Coulomb matrices, which happen to map onto the same eigenvalue spectrum. And if then you use the eigenvalues as a representation, you might encounter this problem of unique, um, of, of absurd results. And this was actually demonstrated for the eigenvalues of the Coulomb matrix um, in, this con in this comment to our PRL. Um, by a scientist um, from Sandia National Lab, uh, Jonathan Musa, who showed that if you rely on eigenvalues only, you could, for example, take this molecule, this linear molecule, acetylene, right, shown in black, and you can, he identified a trajectory uh, shown here in black as, as this orbit, along which the eigenvalue spectrum never changes, okay? And so um, you, you keep the carbons fixed and it's just the hydrogens moving, um, moving along this orbit. And so by construction, then the resulting machine learning model will not detect any energy difference. However, um, uh, PM6 or so semi-empirical quantum chemistry or DFT 
will have obviously uh, a significant barrier since you're reshuffling the bonds here. Right? Um, now, in our um, response to this comment, we um, re-ran this machine learning model, but now with the sorted Coulomb matrix rather with the eigenvalues. And since the Coulomb matrix is unique, you can easily resolve the, the true barrier and, and there's no problem. But this shows you that, um, you know, this orbit is, is not an intuitive trajectory, right? A, a chemist would typically not move, keep the two atoms in the, in the middle fixed and move the outer atoms simultaneously like this. This is not something you would immediately think of. And so one has to be careful, right? This is a valid trajectory though. There might be some instance um, during a high temperature molecular dynamics run where configurations on this orbit are encountered. And so then your, your machine, uh, your machine learning model would introduce such a bias, right? Towards a spurious degeneracy, which um, uh, is certainly, um, uh, highly problematic if you want to um, uh, evaluate the correct Boltzmann averages, right? So this is a, a serious problem. If, if you encounter a representation that lacks uniqueness, um, results have to be taken with, uh, have to be um, interpreted in a very careful way. Right? Uh, there might be a substantial implicit bias. And unless you haven't excluded this, um, you can question those results. Um, <clears throat> so here's another example of um, lack of uniqueness for certain representations. Um, what we want to consider are homometric molecules. Homometric molecules or compounds are compounds which happen to have the same set of interatomic distances. Now consider this um, arrangement of four atoms. Let's just assume it's a planar arrangement um, between atoms one, two, three, and four, and suppose they are all the same chemical element. Now you can also draw this configuration here, this sort of uh, pyramid, uh, also planar. All we did really here was take atom two and move it to the other side of atom four, okay? So uh, two um, completely, so these are non-exotic uh, configurations, right? Now, if you count the interatomic distances, um, you will um, find that actually they have the same set, right? So there's a short one, and a short one, there's a medium one, and a medium one, and a long one, and a long one along the dike, right? So you have two times short, two times medium, and two times long. And um, now let's look at the right. We have a long one and a long one. We have a medium one, and then going from two to three, we also have a medium one. And then we have two short ones from two to four and from four to three. So if you build a vector that lists just these interatomic distances and in the left and the right hand side configuration, that vector will be identical for both of them. So from that, you can see a simple vector, a simple representation using just the distances present in your system will not suffice as a unique representation. You would not be able to distinguish um, these two configurations. Now, how do they differ? You could look at the distribution around each atom, right? In this case, every atom has three bonds, short, medium, and long. In this case, atoms one and four are different. They don't have short, medium, long. Four has short, medium, short, and um, uh, one has long, medium, long, right? So, um, this is um, sort of the, the what's missing, right? You, you, this, is, um, this could be one way to extend the representation. You, you also include some sort of angular distribution right, around each atom. And then you can, um, you might be able to represent this. Now, how would the Coulomb matrices uh, or some, some adjacency matrix look like? 
for these two systems. Here you can see this is the matrix for the left hand um, system, and this one is the matrix for the right hand system. Clearly, two different matrices, right? And these matrices uh, do are unique, right? So it's very important for you to understand that a matrix containing just two body terms is still unique because it, connect, it, it contains the connectivity information as well. The mere list of distances um, has lost this information and so it's no longer unique, right? In other words, these um, top representations and their distance vectors, this is, would be a, two, a, a mere two-body approach, right? If you express your, your, two, your energy in a two-body energy, let's say, a two-body energy uh, function, and these two uh, configurations would be degenerate. It's only upon inclusion of many body interactions that you can distinguish uh, these two configurations. Now, note that many uh, potentials, such as the Leonard Jones potential used in Leonard Jones clusters or Morse potentials and so on, they are merely two body, right? So they would predict these two configurations to be energetically the same. Um, so this lack of uniqueness um, will introduce some leveling off in your learning curve, right? By necessity, you're imposing the error, you're imposing a degeneracy, which implies that your uncertainty will be the difference from that degenerate value to the true um, uh, values. And so this means that you have a residual error uh, which will be noise for your machine. You cannot resolve it anymore. And that means your machine, the learning curve must level off, okay? And um, now um, <clears throat> a really interesting case would be if you manage, I mean, this would be a, a working model, but what might be even more important would be something where you, where you um, can increase the slope, right? Where you can improve the slope, right? And you can view this lack of uniqueness as something that affects your slope, right? It, it, it might, so in the beginning, it, it's like this, and then it, it can do something. Um, now, here's another example of um, homometric um, cases, um, maybe closer to actual chemistry. Imagine two um, ammonia molecules, NH3, um, one's in a planar arrangement and one's in the normal uh, tetrahedral um, pyramidal uh, arrangement. And um, this uh, could, is known as the umbrella switch, right? You, you can go, um, you can invert uh, that nitrogen. This is something that, that actually happens. Um, and so this is um, uh, a non-trivial uh, on uh, a relevant uh, change. And, um, I'd like you to show, um, to, to understand uh, this better, right? You, you can imagine a double well potential um, where your, your ammonia um, was flipped. I'll be showing to you the graph in a second. Right. So this could be an, an energy double well potential for this umbrella switch or umbrella flip of uh, ammonia and the flat, the flat plane of all the four atoms would be the transition state. Right. Um, now let's look at these, right? If you arrange in the transition state, in the flat case, your interatomic uh, distance is such that your nitrogen sits in the center here, and then you have a short, short, short distance and a long, long, long distance on the, on the corners of this, on the edges of this triangle. And at the same time, you have um, the other minimum to be pyramidal. So the nitrogen in yellow here is above the plane and between the hydrogens now you have short, 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 and the, the edges to the nitrogen are long. Then you have two configurations which are homometric. 
And in terms of energy degeneracy, that's the worst you can do. That basically means your transition state, your barrier height is going to be degenerate with your reactant energy. In other words, you don't have a reaction anymore. Right? You, you flattened your reaction profile. The reaction is gone because you used a representation in your machine learning model that um, uh, does not distinguish homometric situations. Um, <clears throat> to demonstrate this, um, and any, incidentally, any two body potential will, will suffer from, this, from the same bias, right? You cannot, you will, you will have a bias in any such uh, reaction, right? And so you see this here, we have a Leonard Jones um, two body potential in the dotted curves and the dotted curves are exactly the same for the two configurations. If you add Leonard Jones and Axel Rotella Muto, then this configuration becomes the solid line and this configuration becomes the dashed solid line. Okay, so then the, the degeneracy is lifted upon inclusion of the three body terms from your axial rotella motor. Now, just because it's lifted in this case, it does not imply yet that your, um, your three body terms will uniquely represent all structures, but it will, they will certainly uniquely represent more structures than a mere two body um, potential, which cannot distinguish between homometric systems. All right. So um, let me see. Okay, it's already 9.22. I'd, I'd suggest we, we do a little break of, of 10 minutes um, and we, or eight minutes, and we reconvene at 9.30.
All right, let's continue. So um, we, we talked now a little bit about the importance of uniqueness, right? Um, I'd still like to give an example of um, how, how we can, how you can manipulate um, the, uh, the training data in, in ways that make um, the resulting machine learning model um, much more general. Right? Um, <clears throat> so, um, and this was um, still published in, in part of this uh, original publication here. Um, so we had um, training data from the FT, right? Um, and the uh, frequency distribution of the distances looked like this right? in, in the minimum. Um, but then um, there was um, this obvious question, well, so these are DFT minimas, but the machine doesn't know about it, that it's a minimum. So the machine would, would just learn those minimas. And if you started to distort a minimum, right, the machine would, would do whatever. Um, and so um, we, we um, did something very, very easy, right? We, we said, well, presume that every molecule sits in a generic binding curve where you can scale the coordinates, right? And at the equilibrium distance, it's, it's in its minimum. And if you scale it out or in, uh, it, it must go up, right? So we know by the very definition of, of um, what we have, that we can say um, that the derivative at the scaling factor being equals one, this derivative must be zero. Then we can say, if you scale it up a factor of three or so, you should roughly have zero energy stored anymore on the bonds, the atomization, right? So we set those energies at F equals three to zero. Um, and the energy at one is the, the DFT, atomization energy. The gradient we set to zero by simply um, including training instances where we scaled all molecules by 0 0.99 or by 1.01, .01, so just 1% distortion around the minimum. And we also set them to the, to the same energy, so a, sort of a finite difference um, imposed um, uh, gradient being zero. And then we say, well, um, roughly at two third for F equals two third, we would expect your binding to become repulsive again. So let's, let's impose that, right? So we inflated our training set, right? We now have molecule scale to this to two third, molecule scale to three, and molecules scaled around the minimum. And we got all the, the corresponding labels for free just by knowing about binding curves, right? which is not rocket science. And then um, you can, of course, train on thousand molecules. So each molecule now has four entries um, or five, depending on how you do it. So we, we trained on 1,000 of those and then tested on the remaining 6,000 and the overall error for the atomization energy was the same as without the others. So the, the scale geometries that did not um, make matters worse, um, but um, we can now use that model to predict the binding curve for a new molecule. And that's what you see here. So we have four test molecules. And you now see the true energy as a function um, of the scaling factor. And you see the machine learning uh, prediction. Now, the prediction is worse for the smallest guy up here, right? Um, this is, it does not work so well. 
But mind you, right in the in this data set, we use molecules with up to seven atoms, and so molecules with six atoms are severely underrepresented. So um, it's not so surprising that the smaller one is is the worst. Um, this one actually has um, uh, seven atoms, um, so this is certainly uh, an unfortunate choice. But these other more more generic molecules uh, without the hetero atoms, right? Um, you see very decent binding curves just by inflating your training set with some uh, known physics, right? So um, these are um, ways when you when you leave the pure statistical learning kind of camp and you you think back about basic things you know about your your systems, right? And um, it can be quite. It should be very easy to encode those in terms of. Um, through data, uh, through training set inflation, basically, right? Um, me, I have a question. Um, yeah. I think it's a super intriguing idea to kind of augment the training data set like that. One thing I wonder is, initially we argued that our method should exactly interpolate the data um, because basically there's no noise on the data. Right. But now with some of those guesses, in particular kind of on the repulsion side, it's not exact anymore, right? It's not zero at exactly two thirds, it's yeah. somewhere close by. Yes. Um, and so can we somehow reflect kind of in the training method that on kind of these augmented data points, we are less confident than on kind of the exact ones? For example, we're so, confident in like B, but not in D. Yes, yeah, so so the, the naive thing, and we did that actually in there is to allow for a bigger noise level, right? But, um, yeah, so, so the point you raise is completely valid, and I don't think yet that there's a generic answer to it. Basically, this amounts to training data where um, the, um, some data is more approximate than others, right? Exactly. And it's also partially inconsistent, right? If, if I went with my DFT um, to three, to a scaling factor of three, right, it's not going to be zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on average, certainly at two third is is not going to be zero, right? Um, but it could be if you look at this, right? We don't actually um, go to zero, right? So we we imposed a little bit. It's also about limits, right? We imposed in the training data limits, and then we test the molecules not on we test the models not on those limits, but rather in between, mm -hmm. right? And so. Um, these are, these are, I think, also very interesting questions, and it's completely unexplored. And um, to which degree you can do this, and what you should expect in terms of test um, errors and so on, um, depending on how far your limits are actually away from your query regime. So um, these things, I, I think, are still uh, very much open. But it is something, right, um, which for us coming from, uh, the atomistic simulation is um, very plausible and intuitive, and in many cases, surprisingly easy uh, to add, right? And this is also, I think that there's a major effort in sort of physics-based machine learning, right? So this goes in this direction. Right? Uh, and um, being good scientists, of course, we should make use of all possible um, means to, to improve our models. All right, so I'd, I'd still like to um, talk a little bit more about representations. And I feel um, like um, today we will um, only be talking about representations. There are other ways to still improve these learning curves, but um, as we just uh, talked about augmenting training data, but I'm afraid we won't have time to touch on all of that. And, and in any case, uh, what I have prepared uh, also constitutes only a selection. Uh, there's much more going on in the field. So I encourage you all to, to um, go beyond that and, and to look also in, in the field and to search for yourself. But um, uh, so this is, um, I, I will focus now mostly on, on these representations, right? So um, <clears throat> you could, um, one, one uh, paper I'd, I wanted to mention is um, something where um, um, a similarly straightforward argument uh, 
has been really um, developed all the way into a representation. And this argument is that you could think of um, a probability density where on every atom coordinate, you put a Gaussian and you make this Gaussian of the height of the nuclear charge, right? Now, that's a very crude, um, but reasonable uh, approximation for um, your electron density, let's say. Um, and you can then Fourier transform this, right? Now, um, the, the problem of, of this top uh, representation would be that it's still rotationally and translationally dependent, right? But uh, index invariant already uh, by mere summation of, of your distribution, uh, of your, your atoms uh, to get that distribution. Now, if you Fourier transform, you, you will get uh, this expression, right? Uh, very straightforward. And then you can multiply this with um, its complex conjugate. Okay. You're taking a sort of the, the norm of the Fourier transforms. And then what you get is uh, something quite interesting. You get something which contains these distance vectors as an argument of a sum over cosine functions, right? Since these are distance vectors, obviously you do no longer depend on the translation. So by mere multiplication in, in Fourier space, uh, you've got rid of the translation and um, um, obviously it still depends on the rotational uh, degrees of freedom, but, but this is um, an interesting thing. And you can also view this, um, if you remember the uh, Coulomb matrix, right? There's some similarity, right? You have the zi, zj as a product. Right? Um, uh, but instead of one over i, you have this cosine function. Um, so because of the similarity, um, we looked at saying, well, um, let's um, take simply, um, and excuse me, this is not a cross product. This is just a normal product. Let's simply take the, the distance uh, length. Okay, um, so if, if we do that, right, then um, you have a simple scalar here and you, you've made this, uh, this um, uh, transposed uh, frequency here becomes a simple scalar, right? So it becomes a one dimensional uh, uh, kind of uh, frequency dependent function, right? And so you, you have this function which you can plot in terms of omega now. Okay. Um, so this is how it looks like um, for various values of the interatomic distance. Right? So you can imagine an interatomic distance between um, uh, in a diatomic and you have here uh, values for the diatomic H2, hydrogen, helium and B, HC, HCl, okay? And what you notice is that, um, of course, as your, your distance increases, it becomes more and more, the frequency increases. Um, and what you also notice is, as the difference in nuclear charges increases, this envelope, right? If there's zero distance, then the, the, the full uh, function, the function, full function is covered. Uh, and as the, the difference in Z increases, it gets squeezed, squeezed uh, closer and closer to uh, the zero distance limit, okay? So, so this is um, uh, a way uh, to represent um, different um, systems, right? Uh, across chemical compound space. And so um, we wanted to explore this then um, for uh, systems with, with uh, many atoms. And uh, one of the first tests was these, these homometric uh, molecules. And you could see now that um, here, these uh, distance distributions, um, as we mentioned them earlier, they would naturally be accounted for um, in, this, in this thing. But um, uh, if, uh, not if you simply put the distance in here. You, you would need uh, this distribution of distances as a cosine argument. And so um, that's what you see now here. Basically, this, this was hacked, right? And you insert this uh, distance distributions instead. And then you get a function which looks something like this, okay? 
So these are now the homometric guys, um, uh, the rectangular and the triangular are shown here and, and uh, dashed, right? Uh, ones for um, H4 and um, so four hydrogen atoms, that's what you see down here, right? And so you see the two homometric cases, they um, this differ by the depth of uh, these peaks. And if you go to helium four, right, these two would look like this. Right? So um, there's one dimensional projection now um, can distinguish homometric uh, cases. So what happens if you apply this to a larger molecule? Here you see three different molecules, right? Um, using this representation, which um, uh, goes down to zero. As, as you add more atoms, um, you, you increase the length of this function, right? So this is actually related to your intermolecular distance and bore, right? So as the, the radius of your molecule grows, you, you, this fingerprint will, will increase in length. Um, and um, <clears throat> it's uh, very spiky. We believe um, that it's, it's because of this um, uh, distribution in here, which goes for every atom for the system, uh, we think that these are unique uh, fingerprints, unique one-dimensional fingerprints. One um, sort of um, aspect that um, does not look so promising is that um, you, they, they are very uh, spiky, right? And so uh, this does not, uh, it's not a smooth uh, function you can nicely interpolate. And so machine learning models actually are not so promising with this. So this uh, Fourier representation is shown here in red now on the, on the QM7 data set. And you see there's some learning in the beginning. You, you can reach something like an uh, interesting uh, uh, error, right? So this is not a terrible result, but it's no, no better than the Coulomb matrix, uh, the sorted Coulomb matrix, uh, which improves it further. Um, yeah, so um, these are, we, we think there's still something missing, but um, from uh, these, um, these results here, you can see that um, there, there are ways to get um, fingerprints that are consistent with the underlying physics that are meaningful, right? Here, for instance, you have, you see the bonds. Um, the, these are first neighbor bonds and then second, third, and so on bonds, um, which are peak here. And these are uh, non-covalent uh, bonds, if you wish, right? Um, so you, you can, um, um, extract something meaningful, even though it's a low dimensional representation of, of a high dimensional object such as a molecule. <clears throat> so um, we wanted to look further into this question of the representation in this paper, where the title is Understanding Representation. And there uh, was an experiment which um, we did not really find in the in the literature of statistical learning, so we, we just did it ourselves. But um, it it must be out there in, in textbooks and so on. And um, suppose you you want to learn as a target function um, and, uh, a Gaussian function, and this is shown here in red in this inset. Right? It, it's a bit hard to see, but there's a red function in here, and it's a Gaussian function, and um, we wanted to see if, if that is your target function, right? What should be your representation? And here the representation is simply a linear function. So there's a, a straight uh, blank line here that could be a representation, right? Um, but we tried also other representations, for instance, a quadratic function, which you see here, right? Or just an exponentially decaying function, which you see here in, in uh, dashed, okay? Um, so the learning curve for um, your linear representation is shown here as this black line coming down. This is the mean absolute error, the deviation from your model from a Gaussian target, okay? And if you use a quadratic function, you don't see learning. 
okay? Even though this quadratic function in the beginning might look really good, but that actually gives you rapidly some offsets. So we, we don't really start at zero, right? We start at 10, 10 training data points. So with 10 training data points, you, you already got what, what there was to get, right? And, and then it doesn't improve anymore because even if you add more training data here, you see roughly one third of the range of X values and the, the representation can no longer properly account for um, the decaying uh, Gaussian because here actually you lag uniqueness, right? You're getting, there's no, it's not monotonic, right? And so if this is your representation, it cannot resolve if your X values in between one and two or between two and three. Right? And so this is how it gets manifested uh, immediately in, in the learning curve. Now, um, what you also see here, sort of superimposed with the linear function is the dashed, the dotted lines. This was the exponentially decaying function as a representation. Right? And you see it's no better than linear. Right? So sometimes, uh, still the simplest can still be the best. But um, what you can do, of course, is go in the exponential and put an exponent to the X, right? And if your exponent is two, then you recover the Gaussian. Right? And so Bing did this, he put an exponent of 1.25 and all of a sudden your learning curve comes down, puts an ex exponent of 1.75, it comes down, puts an exponent of two, so sort of cheating, right? You put in the target as a representation and you get the best learning curve. You increase the exponent to 2.25 and it comes up again. So this learning curve as a function of the exponent, right? Is, is, it's a manifold where the optimum of your learning curve is where your exponent exactly matches the, the Gaussian exponent of two. So this would suggest then that the best representation is your target function. And, and so that, there's, that, that would mean that if we, if we learn energies, right, something that resembles the energy should be a good uh, representation. So if you, if you consider then the Coulomb matrix as an energy function, it's not so obvious how, how to make a, a nice energy function out of it. But something such as one over R behavior, right? And so this was originally, that's, that's one of the reasons why, why I proposed this. We know as atoms dissociate, the interaction will decay. And so that's something you would like to have in the Coulomb, uh, in the Coulomb matrix. So that's why we have the one over R law in there. But it's not clear how to improve this in terms of accuracy, but what's quite obvious is how to make things worse, right? So you can um, simply uh, play with this exponent. And if you put N to minus one, right, then the, the um, octagonal element increases with the distance linearly, right, as shown here in red. And if you put uh, minus two, then it increases quadratically. So interactions increasing with the distance is obviously unphysical, right? Now, does this then result in your learning curve getting worse, right? That was the question. And um, so if, if this is the Coulomb matrix, now on actual QM9 data, um, and your exponent is N equals one, right? So just one over R, that's roughly how it looks like for the sorted Coulomb matrix and the in a Laplacian kernel. And now you change N to minus one, sure enough, your learning curve goes up. You increase it more, your learning curve goes up even more. Right? So there's this notion, right, that you could use the learning curve actually to find, you could use it in a penalty to query your data to find what is the, the actual underlying energy function, at least to some degree, right? This uh, seems to be justified as a working hypothesis. We, of course, uh, then went around and looked at other exponents and it turns out within this kernel method, your, your optimum would be around a, an exponent of six, which is of course uh, uh, 
we, we all like that, right? That's the London dispersion uh, decay law. So, so that's something very attractive to us. Um, so on average, that seems to be um, the best um, exponent. So based on this experiment, we then thought, well, um, if, if that's true, then, then we should, a good estimate of the energy is a four speed. Right? That's, that's what um, we, the community has been uh, come up with over the decades. So we um, started to look at the universal force field. And this is from 1992, a paper with uh, um, Bill Goddard III and Andrew Ruppe. Um, it's a beautiful paper, right? It contains all the parameters for universal force field. Um, and in particular, it contains bonds, so two body. Um, it contains angles, so the two body are Morse or Leonard Jones, if, if uh, non covalent. Angular is, is uh, some, some uh, parabolic um, kind of potential and also torsional uh, potential um, for, for the dihedrates, right? So we have two, three, and four bodies here. Okay? Um, and so we, we call this the, the bonds, angles, and so on. So, so Bummel, right? Uh, bonds, angles, machine learning. Um, and um, <clears throat> we can uh, include this only for bonds, right? So this is now on the 6,000 isomers from QM9. And this is your learning curve. If you just include bonds in your representation and you're actually worse than the Coulombic. So the bonds um, would suffer from uh, not covering homometric uh, molecules. Right? Um, but um, if you, as soon as you include angles, you get a dramatic improvement in, in learning. Um, and as you include torsion, um, there's even some more. Right? So um, that is very encouraging. Right? It, it, it realigns with the, the more the idea: the more physics you include in your representation the better your model will be. Um, so we tested this also on other properties in QM9. And for all properties, you observe this trend, which is also in line with the, with the wave function kernel analogy, right? So the better your representation, the better your kernel, the better your wave function, the better it works for all properties, all observables, right? Um, so for all these observables, you consistently observe that bonds are worse than angles are worse than torsion. I mean, always adding uh, angles to bonds and, and, and torsions added to angles and bonds. And in terms of errors, we, we looked at the most severe outliers, okay? Uh, it's these three molecules um, shown here in green, red, and blue. And you see, um, if you just have your, your dressed atoms, so not even bonds, right? These are sort of averages um, in the entire data set. Then you add bonds. Uh, this is the remaining error. It becomes smaller for all the three of them. For angles, the error becomes smaller and for torsion, it becomes smaller. So systematically, even for the most extreme outliers, you observe um, this uh, improvement by adding the right thing. And then we have repeated the same experiment now with the entirety of QM9. And again, we recover this, uh, this kind of trend. All right, let me um, skip ahead here and tell you about a paper which then appeared later on in 2017 with collaborators from Google um, who also wanted to throw in some neural networks. And so we looked at um, machine learning, various machine learning models. These are different representations. And these are regressors, which contain neural nets. This GG and GC are neural nets. And uh, the stars are random forests and this kernel rich regression. Um, and for the kernel rich regression, we, we tested various representations. And you see that um, <clears throat> for each and every property, there's at least one model which um, uh, really comes close to DFT, uh, sorry, to um, uh, chemical accuracy, um, which is shown here in black. And for each uh, property, um, uh, the DFT accuracy, um, which is shown here in dash uh, or here, um, is surpassed by at least one model. 
Um, so this was the important thing. In terms of kernels, we had a representation called HDAD, which sort of built on this Bummel idea. And HDAD stands for histogram of distances, angles, and dihedrals. And so it's, it's simply a histogram, right? In the Bummel, we actually use the, the functional forms to, to, to um, scale the distances uh, according to uh, the expressions. But um, in this case, we, we simply use the histogram and um, you, you get a quite impressive performance. So this is in green um, for various properties. So in particular, um, if you look at the atomization energy, right, you see that the kernel rich regression with HDAD has the best performance in, among all these models. So it, it couldn't really get simpler than just the histogram of these structures. Um, so um, <clears throat> we um, uh, worked with with, um, uh, with many others to further these uh, these machine and these learning curves and these representations. And what you see now here is the error on the atomization energy uh, with the Coulomb matrix, Bob Bammel, and HDAT. Okay, these are the the sort of the learning curves over time, right? How they came down only by improving the representation. Um, uh, Felix Farber was a PhD student in, in our group who recently graduated um, and part of his PhD was to come up with um, sort of the culmination of all the best uh, insights and um, to implement them into a single representation. And um, this representation was supposed to be as generic as possible. So we call that the FCHL representation. Um, these letters stand for the first letters of the last names of all the authors. So the idea is to have an expansion in bodies, okay? So one body, two body, three body. Um, and your one body would be, um, uh, a Gaussian sitting in the periodic table. So here you have period and here you have group. Um, and so it's a 2D Gaussian, uh, which defines your elemental composition for each atom, okay? the atom I. And the two body then is your one body times a sum over two body contribution. Right? And so you, you can imagine this being nested like this, then the free body is the that one body times the sum over two body times the sum over three bodies and so on and so forth. Right? So that's the expansion. The two body distribution is uh, in, in terms of Gaussian is, is simply uh, shown here for three different molecules, right? These could be the, the two body distribution. And then the three body distributions are shown here as, as angles. And we also test the torsions and so on and so forth. Um, now, um, using um, the insights from this Coulomb matrix experiment uh, by playing with the exponent and from the Bummel and the HDAD, we, um, we um, include scaling functions with these distributions. So the representation is not just this distribution, but we scale it by the distance with some power law. And um, that uh, power law contains an exponent then, which we include in the hyperparameter optimization. And so um, if you do this, you can uh, do some comparisons on how uh, in certain dimensions, right? How unique this representation is. This was done here. Um, you can do PCAs on the resulting kernels. So this is a Coulomb matrix kernel PCA. Um, this is a Bob kernel PCA, and this is the FCHL kernel PCA. Right? So um, if you have a blob like this, this means basically that just the two main uh, principal components, they, uh, do not, they don't offer enough dimensionality to fully um, span out your data, right? Basically, you're missing additional dimensions behind the plane here such that um, there's, there's, um, the superimposed points can be spread out in a monotonic fashion. And um, similarly here for Bob, but here you see now that these two dimensions are basically enough to uh, monotonically um, step from one compound to the next. 
And that would suggest that um, this FCHL has cast your um, problem in a lower dimension, which makes it easier to learn. So um, uh, this was, um, these are the, the learning curves I, I mentioned before already. Um, there was also a neural network message passing um, network um, published by um, some of our colleagues from, from Google as well, right? Only trained on the largest training set. Um, and then there was SHNET, which is another um, neural network. Um, we also had uh, um, a many body descriptor. There's a kernel method coming up. Um, and then um, we um, finally got the FCHL curve is, is this black, this black line here. Um, SOAP, which is um, from Gabo Sani in Cambridge, is shown here in, in yellow. Um, and um, we, we also have um, the, the slatin, which is another representation that I didn't talk about. Um, this FCHL is, is this black line. And uh, at the time, it, it was sort of the, the most performing system. It's very intriguing because for QM9, you reach 0 0.06 EV. Um, so this is nearly chemical accuracy with already only 1,000 training, training molecules, right? So um, remember that um, for, for in the original PAL, right, with, with this uh, Coulomb matrix here, um, to reach uh, something like 10 kcal per mole, you needed 6,000 molecules. And this was a smaller training, uh, a smaller chemical space, right? So um, this is certainly um, a lot of exciting progress that has been made. Now, um, FCHL can also be uh, applied to solids. And so we tested it on this OQMD data set um, by Chris Wolverton and colleagues. Um, and you see it, it also uh, offers a, a very nice uh, learning curve. Um, we also looked at other data sets like QM7B, uh, these are um, uh, side chain interactions, and their water clusters, a fossilized with a, a bunch of crystals. And you see that FCHL typically performs very well in these. Um, we also look at FCHL for all the different properties in QM9. And you see this CHL is, is basically this black A3. You see that for the atomization energy, it's very good, but for other properties, and these, uh, so the, the nomenclature has changed here. This M uh, corresponds to Bummel, I believe. And um, uh, you see for some properties like the electronic energies, actually Bummel performs better. So what I said before, right? That um, your kernel does not know about the property. In principle, it's true, but it, it could still be, or it, it is, um, it is uh, a matter of fact that if you allow for your kernel to, um, to adapt to a specific profit property, you might still gain something in terms of data efficiency. Right? So it's not a necessity for you to have a property ignorant kernel. Uh, you can work with a property ignorant kernel. Your, your training curves must, your learning must work, but um, you could go beyond by allowing for property dependent kernel. And um, finally, since in FCHL, we also encoded the chemical, the elemental composition explicitly, we did a little experiment, which is um, sort of complicated. So let me just briefly explain this here. Um, so these are basically, this is an overview of single double triple bonds, right? So on the left, you have nitrogen, doing um, a triple bond with carbon, silicon, or germanium. That's what you see in this panel up here. Below you have phosphorus doing the same triple bond and arsenide doing the same triple bond. So um, these elements still have a hydrogen then attached to, to the other side. And in this column in the middle, you have double bonds, so oxygen and carbon. So this is from aldehyde. aldehyde. Um, uh, for, for all these three elements going down the, the uh, columns in the periodic table. And here you have single bonds in the right-hand column, okay? Now, <clears throat> what do these curves uh, correspond to? These are the binding curves. 
once evaluated with DFT. So that's the reference and you, you see that in these crosses. And then there are machine learning predictions, right? On um, superimposed and on many curves, they, they are so close to each other that it's hardly distinguishable. Uh, maybe the largest outlier is the prediction of this um, HCN molecule here, um, where you have the largest deviation. Now, the machine that makes this prediction here uh, for this blue line, this machine has neither seen nitrogen nor carbon. Okay. So it has not seen the PC and the arsenide carbon, right? Um, and it hasn't seen, um, of course, the, the nitrogen being bonded to silicon or germanium in this panel. Right? So it's fully ignorant of the two elements that form that bond. It has been trained on combinations of all the other elements. Um, and so um, this is, um, uh, how we can uh, make that statement that we can actually make predictions of uh, energetics of stoichiometries that were not part of training. So we can truly learn um, not only across constitutional isomers, but also across uh, stoichiometries. Right. Now, um, we phrased um, at an IPAM reunion meeting a couple of years ago, we phrased the QM9 IPAM challenge which is um, a bunch of uh, PIs uh, whose names are here, and they all committed to donate $100 uh, to whoever comes up with a machine learning model that would reach um, this um, prediction error for training set size of 100. All right. Um, <clears throat> I would still like to add, uh, to discuss uh, briefly one more paper. Um, if we go to um, the, this paper where we did the comparison with the Google guys, there's one property for which basically all models, all kernel models um, uh, made very bad, poor predictions in comparison to a neural net. There's a neural net down. And that's the dipole model. And so we were wondering why this is the case. And um, we devised uh, or we revised the kernel method to include uh, derivatives and, and response, uh, the, the response in um, the loss function. So we can extend the loss function to include um, operators uh, that are differential in, in nature. So if you have some, um, some property um, that um, is an operator of the energy, differential operator, right? Then you could uh, carry through this um, differentiation. Um, and again, with this analogy of your kernel being, being like your system, representing your system, you should then um, apply that differential operator on that system rather than just on the regression coefficient. So we can include um, these, uh, so for instance, gradients, um, in your loss function in this way. Um, and then we get um, updated regression coefficients that account for these response behavior. Right? So actually you can uh, do this for the, uh, the various um, brackets here. We can write those out and you see you have derivatives of your kernel um, with respect to the variables you're varying to. Um, and you can also do this for second order derivatives. Right. So, so you can include arbitrarily many um, expansions right, into your loss function and make sure that if, if you have these derivatives for training, then um, your, your loss function um, can account for this. And so here you see the electric field derivative, which is the dipole moment. Um, you see this um, included in a machine learning model where we plot the energy as a function of the angle in an electric field, right? Now, um, if you, so in, in red, you see the MP2 reference, right? And if you do not include the derivative in training and you just have one training point, you would actually uh, get a machine learning model which does not know about this field, right? And so it will not correspond to, will not respond to the field. 
But if you include this derivative here, then actually you get, now this point is, it's, it's a bit silly. It's just one training point. It was chosen such that it looks really good. So, um, but then your machine all of a sudden uh, imposes that gradient and then um, it, it looks much better. Now for this, of course, you need a representation then that includes an electric field, right? So in all previous um, uh, machines, we had zero electric field. So that electric field in your Hamiltonian was never represented in uh, the Coulomb matrix, let's say, right? And so um, for this, we, we included an electric field in um, the FCHL representation. And basically what we did was to, um, to add some very simple approximate um, model of an elect electric field um, such that um, you, you would have a representation FCHL that knows about the electric field. And then of course you can differentiate with respect to it. And once you do that, you um, have a loss function which knows about your electric field. And then uh, you get a learning curve like this for the dipole moment in QM9. So when before it, it looked like the red one upon inclusion of the electric field in your, elect, in your di uh, representation and in your loss function, you, you've got this improvement here. So a simple extension, physics driven um, extension of your representation allows you to um, much improve uh, the learning. Now, of course, you can do the same game with forces on atoms, right? These are also just derivatives and also here, you see significant improvement. And so we, we have machine learning, uh, learning curves now of energies and forces of various uh, molecules for which um, uh, MD trajectories have been uh, used. And so um, we can use um, also here the um, uh, errors on energies and forces with and without um, the learning curve, right? So that's what you see in, in green. Um, so the green uh, knows about the response property and, and the red is, is unknown. So um, with this slide, I'd, I'd like to conclude now. Yes, is there a question? No. Okay, so with this line, uh, slide, I'd like to conclude uh, today's lecture. Um, <clears throat> you, um, I hope I could convince you that um, we, we, these learning curves are incredibly useful for us to, to measure uh, progress in, in terms of improving machine learning models. And you should be careful of, of models due to lack of uniqueness or noise in the data. Um, or uh, overly rigid models, right? Um, they will, will level off like this. Um, and of course, what um, you would like is a data efficient model. So a model that A works and then B could be made uh, more data efficient by encoding um, the right physics in, in your data sets or in your representations. So um, uh, with this, I'd like to conclude and I thank you all for your attention and for attending this course um, and uh, I, I still uh, wish you a good uh, continuation of your studies and um, all the best to you all and uh, I hope to see you in private if you're not already members of my group maybe at a later occasion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the lecture. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.